reach out and touch you and say that we love you. Open our ears, Lord, and help us
brings fire to my soul. And Jesus, I come. Beholding your face, I am changed from glory to glory. Now I see. Touch of your life brings glory to my soul. Jesus, Jesus, from darkness to light, my life overflows. I am changed from glory to glory. Now I see, now I know. One touch of your life brings glory to my soul. of your life brings glory to my soul. Now I see, now I know. One touch of your life brings glory to my soul.
Father, we thank you for meeting us here tonight, Lord God. And Father, uh, it's always wonderful to be with you and be with your people, Lord, to, to be loved by you, Lord God. And We pray, Lord, tonight that, Father, you'd work in us, Lord God. We pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to make the word of God alive and Father, whatever you would have us to know, Lord God, whatever you would have us to become, Father, work those things in us, Lord God. And Father, we expect from you because of who you are, Lord God. We thank you for your greatness, Lord God. Thank you for all that you've done already, Lord, but Father, complete a little bit more of that work in us tonight, Lord God, as you give us understanding and knowledge of the Holy One. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. First Samuel 7. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7. We have learned that Israel has been in a war against the Philistines and they've lost the first battle. They've lost 4,000 men. And then they decided they would take the Ark of the Covenant and hopefully that they would win. They believed that without a doubt because the Ark of the Covenant was with them, they would win. They went into battle against the Philistines again and they ended up losing 30,000 men and the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and took it into their temple of Dagon. And as we remember the story how the first time they found Dagon in front of the Ark of the Covenant bowing down, the second time bowing down with his arms and his head cut off. And finally they began to get diseases and sicknesses and hemorrhoids and then they sent the Ark of the Covenant back and the city of Kirjath-Jerim took it back and that's where we are in chapter 7 and hopefully we're going to be able to go through two chapters tonight but there's some really wonderful things that God will work in us tonight let's start on verse 1 then the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and he brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer's son to keep the ark of the Lord. So we see two things we want to share with in the very first verse and that is the ark of the covenant goes to Kirjath Jerem. It was supposed to go to a place called Shiloh, remember? Shiloh was a place where literally God had put it apart and that's where the ark of the covenant was supposed to be. That's where they were supposed to act or offer up sacrifices. But what happened to the place we call Shiloh is that the Philistines destroyed that. The war and the, the rebellion against God brought them into a place where God judged them and that judgment meant that they lost the war and they lost their city. It was destroyed by the Philistines and so they had no city to take it back. So they take it to kirjath Jerem, and this man who was Eliezer's son keeps the house or keeps the uh, Ark of the Covenant because they believe he is from the tribe of, of Levi. He has to be a member of the tribe of Levi. So he is taking care of this and he's consecrated and anointed specifically for that. Now he goes on in verse 2 and it's going to get a lot more interesting. So it was that the Ark remained in Kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there for 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented so we see that this ark of the covenant stayed there many believe about a hundred years it stayed in this place David will be the king that will take it back and he'll have problems in taking it back also because he doesn't take it back the way that God says and prescribed that the priests are supposed to carry it on pole he takes it in the cart and one guy Uriah gets killed. He puts his hand on, uh, on the ark because it gets unstable and he dies and so David becomes fearful. But he will bring it back. David will bring it back after a few months. He finds out how to bring it back like God says scripturally and he's successful and brings it back. And we see in this part here the house of Israel laments. And the reason why they're lamenting, they're crying and weeping. The people and the children are crying and weeping is because all their towns are ruined. They are now in more bondage than they were before to the Philistines. And the reason is because they're not right with God. Now, 
We are going to see as we go through the scripture, being right with God is not an exterior thing, it's an interior thing. Being right with God doesn't mean that you are a religious person or you are a person who follows rules and laws. Because you're, we've, we'll find out as we walk with God as time goes on that we are going to fall short. We're going to miss the mark. And I never want to miss the mark, but it happens to all of us where we fall into things that are contrary to God. As you grow in God, you're to mature more and those things should be less and less and they should fall out. Your life should be one more of holiness. But I've found it to be true. The holier you become, the more you realize how unholy you are. It doesn't in any way put you in a place of your heart says, man, I've got it now. I've arrived. I am so holy. I wish all of you were like me. It doesn't get you in that place, I promise. What it does get you in the place of where it says, you know what? The closer you draw to God, the more you see clearly, the more you see your fallings or your shortcomings, so to say. And being right with God literally means that your heart is right. You may look at a person whose life still has things in there that are obvious sin and God is going to work in them but they may be right in God's sight more than you are let me explain that God looks at the heart and the heart of that person would say this I'm not perfect I'm not completely done concerning holiness or godliness but I want whatever God wants and I want God to work in me and I don't care what it takes I want to be like God I want to have that intimacy with God and I want nothing between us. That's the heart that God looks at. And that's right in the sight of God. I've seen it where people are right on the outside but not right on the inside. So it's very important that we understand what it means by being right in the sight of God. Spurgeon wrote this. He says, it may very naturally be asked where was Samuel at this time? Samuel's not mentioned. For about 20 years, Samuel's not mentioned. I know not what he was doing during these 20 years, but I have a suspicion. I may say I have a firm persuasion that he was going from place to place, preaching in quiet spots wherever he would gather an audience, warning the people of their sin and stirring them up to seek Jehovah. This endeavor to infuse some spirituality into their natural lives. So Samuel was still working, though he's not mentioned. Now, verse 3. Then Samuel spoke to all of Israel, and he said this. If you return to the Lord with all your heart, and put away your foreign gods, and the asterisks from among you, and you prepare your heart for the Lord, and you serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So as we go through this, I want to remind you something. This is a conditional promise from God. In other words, God makes a promise and he says this. If you will do this. Now, I want, I want to back up just for a second. I want to remind you where they are. They're in captivity. Their, ha their homes are destroyed. They're a mess. Everything has been destroyed. Now they're really into slavery. And so Samuel has been speaking to God. And God tells Samuel, this is what I want you to tell my people. But it's a, a conditional promise that if they will do these things, I promise you, I will deliver you. Now, God makes a similar promise to us as Christians today. Now, you may think, well, there is no such thing as a conditional promise with God. Yes, there is. God makes conditions. Now, I'm not saying that everyone. There are some, you are saved by grace. That's not a conditional promise. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with completely with God. God says, if you, by faith, accept me, I will save you by grace. Period. It's all on God. Period. But on these, there are times that God says, if you sow this, you're going to reap this. That's a conditional promise. If I go out and sow certain things, seeds of corn, I'm going to have corn. And I'm going to love corn. Lots of corn. I like corn. 
If I sell watermelons, I'm gonna, my watermelons don't work. I'm going to just get vines. That's what I'm going to get. <laughs> That's how it works. But if I sow thistles, without a doubt, I'm going to get those thistles, and I hate thistles. That's how it works. You may say, well, no. Nah. Yes, it does. That's how it works. So God tells them the conditions, and here they, here's, here, here they are. If you return to me with all your heart and put away your foreign God. So he's, the first two conditions. Put away, I'm sorry, if you return to me with all your heart. So Samuel is calling this nation to repentance. The repentance had to be inwardly with all their hearts. And it had to be outwardly putting away their gods. Let's talk about that just for a second. So, when God speaks to them, he tells them, you have to turn away from your sin. You have to repent. You have to say, and commit yourself to God and say, okay, now I want to put this away. So, in other words, I can't just go to God and say, okay, God, forgive me and not do anything concerning repentance. Because God wasn't going to allow that. God wasn't going to say, okay, you say you're sorry and, and you confess it, but you know what? You're going to still serve the gods that I said to put away, it isn't going to work like that. The inward was more important than the outward, and it had to come first. That is why Samuel first called Israel to return with all their hearts and then told them to put away their foreign gods. Now, however, inward repentance is a secret thing. It is hidden. No one can really see it or see the heart of another. Yet the inward was proven by the outward. We can know if Israel did return with all their heart by seeing if they really did put away their foreign gods. No one could see their heart, but they could see if they put away their foreign gods. I like that. Now, if Israel wanted victory over the Philistines, they would have to put away their gods, period. In other words, you can't make half changes. God wants all your heart. These guys couldn't feel sorry during church and then wish things were better. They needed to go home and throw away their astronauts, their false gods. If you really return to the Lord, then this makes an appropriate change. True repentance of the heart will throw out the magazines that shouldn't be read, uh, the block that needs to be put on pornography, and will put away things that they are tempted by. Now he goes on in verse 4. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Asherods, and they served the Lord only. So they respond exactly to the word of God, and you're going to see in a little bit they're going to be delivered, but they're obeying God concerning the word of God. Now I want to share with you, because I think it's important, The meaning of this god, Astaroth, it means star, the name. This is plural form. The singular is Astrith. That was the main female goddess that was worshipped by just about everybody at the time in some shape or form. She was called Astaroth by the Phoenicians, Estar by the Assyrians, and Aphrodite by the Greeks. She was considered the moon goddess and was thought to be married to some form of Baal, the sun god. Solomon brought the worship of her into Israel in 1 Kings 11. Jezebel had 400 priests dedicated to her or to serve her in 1 Kings 18. And she would still be a part of Israelite culture right to Jeremiah's day when she was called the Queen of Heaven. If you were to summarize the worship of Astaroth, it would be everything pornographic. Samuel didn't ask the nation to just take the good from Astaroth. 
and Baal and throw away the rest. He called them to renounce the rival gods completely. At this time in their history, Israel did this. Now, I want to remind you that just for your own information that anything we put before God is a God. Anything we put before God can become an idol. And anything that we make an idol, we can worship or we will worship. And man today, and I'm talking about not Christians, but the world today worshiped Ashtaroth in a great way. You've heard me say that pornography is a number one seller on the internet. It makes billions and billions and billions of do dollars. Men, they say, are 60% of the buyer and women are 40% of the buyers. So what I'm saying is, is that it is the number one seller. It is number one in ma mankind today. Worshipped, worships Asteroid. In other words, are solely involved in pornography and they are totally enslaved by it. And God calls man to, and I say mankind, to get away from pornography and stop worshiping this God. Now he goes on in verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together all of Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day, and they said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel. I want you to notice what Samuel does. He says, I'm going to pray for you. Samuel knows the power of prayer and he knows the importance of prayer for family and for enemies and for friends. The Bible teaches that there is a power of the Spirit of God. It is called the dunamis power. We use the same word called dynamite. That's what we use the same word for. That's where we get it from. And God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit, but he's also given us a power concerning prayer we as a body have seen more answered prayer I think than we in the last few years than we ever have and God has answered so many prayers concerning, concerning people concerning their healings concerning diseases and everything else and I believe one of the greatest weapons that God has given us as Christians the Bible says in the book of Ephesians when we talk about the spiritual warfare that we're in is prayer but I believe one of the most neglected things that we as Christians is also prayer, is that we don't make time for it. You know, in the book of, and it's one of my favorite scriptures, in the book of Philippians, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And literally it talks about being anxious and it talks about how life can get hard and we can get worried so to say and fearful and then God gives us the antidote of praying and entrusting those things or those people to him and the Bible says that God will fill your heart and your mind with peace now we can go about trying to get that peace in a different way but God has given us the gift of prayer and he says here's how you get that peace that will surpass understanding and this is really personally I believe one of the only ways and so being a leader imagine this you're leading the people and they're in slavery so to say and you've given them the word of God and now God says I want you to pray for them so Samuel says now I'm going to pray for you it would be a heavy burden I would think for a man leading the nation spiritually and he knows where he needs to go to get the power and the strength and the ability to lead is through prayer, prayer. Now, notice here where it says that he drew water and he poured it out before the Lord. This is a ceremony of pouring of the water. In context, it was a demonstration of having one soul poured out before the Lord. 
It was an expression of emptiness and need. So imagine this. These people literally are pouring their soul out to God. God, I need you. I'm empty. And we've all found out to be true that without God, there is so much emptiness within our own selves. When a man walks in his flesh, or a woman walks in their flesh, and they're a Christian, they fill that empty void within them. And only God can fill that. And what they need to do literally is the same thing here as these people did, is pour out their soul to God. Because God's the only one that can fill these places. It says here, and they fasted that day, and they said that we have sinned. You know, David made this statement when he was confronted with sin by Nathan the prophet. He had committed adultery, he had killed, murdered, had Uriah murdered. For a year he went on and naturally trying to be and not confessing his sin and God sends Nathan to him and he, he admits it. He says, you're right, I've sinned. And he makes this statement, he says, I have sinned against God and God only. Not against Bathsheba, or not against Uriah, not against anyone, but against God. Because he knew that every sin was against God. So he admits his sin. It, it is important as Christians that we deal with sin. But we deal with, with it honestly for, before God. Let me tell you what we, can, what we can do as Christians. We can say this to God. Oh God, you know what I did. You know, you know, and God, forgive me if I've, if, listen to my prayer, and forgive me, God, if it was my fault. If I had any sin in this situation, forgive me, God, if I, if I, and you know what? There's no ifs. If you bring your heart before God and you say this to God, God, and you ain't even got to even ask God to show you anything. I can tell you today, if I go to God and I say to God, God, I sinned. And if I'm quiet, God doesn't have to show me nothing. Because I already know what I did and what was my responsibility or wasn't my responsibility, what I did and what I didn't do. God doesn't have to tell me. I already know it. And I have to be honest with myself and be quiet so God can cleanse me and wash me because God desires that. And I don't want nothing between me and my God. So if there's something that I need to deal with, and God's convicting me, I don't need to beat around the bush. I need to just talk to God. God, I blew it. I was stupid. I said this. And, it, and I, when I confess to God, I don't do this. I promise I don't. But God, they made me do that. If they wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have hit them. If they wouldn't have acted that way, I wouldn't have acted that way. I don't say any of those things because I, being honest before God, you can't say any of those things. And the reason why God wants you to confess is because he wants nothing between you and them. My wife and I, we talked about this. and I made an agreement between me and God. And I tell her about this whenever I do anything like this. I'll never let anything get between me and my children, ever. I don't care what it is. Never. I'll just say, forget it. I won't agree with it. I'll say that you're wrong, but I'm not going to argue about it. I'm not letting it get between me and you and our relationship. I don't care. I'm not letting that happen. But I got that from my relationship with God because I don't want nothing to get between me and my God. And so if there's something between me and God, it's never God, it's always me. So I have to say, okay, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong and I did this. Not, oh, okay, God, if, if I did this or, you know, if, if you, I was wrong, if, that's a cop out, man, I'm telling you. I don't want nothing between me and God. So it's important that I can confess my sins. Now he goes on, and Samuel judged the children of Israel. Samuel was a 
judge and he was a judge his whole life. We don't know exactly how many years Samuel judged, but he judged probably between 50 and 60 years. Imagine being in ministry for 50 or 60 years, being a spiritual leader, and the scripture teaches literally that he was a faithful man concerning being a judge. I don't think there could be a better statement made than he was a faithful man to God and when his calling. Verse 7. Now, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to pray or cry out to the Lord our God for us, for he that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Now let's talk something about concerning confidence. Does God want us to be confident? Without a doubt, he does. Confident in truth and confident that confidence that prepares our hearts to be able to be confident. These people had taken the Ark of the Covenant and they had went into battle and they had confidence without a doubt that they were going to win because they had the Ark of the Covenant. And they thought, you know what? I, I'm going to have this. This is it. We're going to have victory. We have the Ark of the Covenant. We can't lose. And they ended up getting defeated. 30,000 killed. But it was a false confidence. The Lord was not with them in any way. And now they are in a place of repentance. They are in a place of humbleness. And they say to Samuel, please pray that God will give us and deliver us from the Philistines. They're in a perfect place of dependency on God. And literally they have the greatest confidence that they can have because they're in the right place within their own hearts. It's not what you see on the outside that should make you confident. It's what's going on on the inside that should make you confident. Your relationship with God concerning death should make you confident without a doubt in what Christ has done. That when you face death, God tasted it for you through Jesus Christ. And God will enter into, or you'll enter into a place with God forever and ever and eternity. And you're going to see people that you've known before. And you're going to see people that will come behind you. That your family and your friends and people that you love. This is the confidence that God wants. But no, when I stand before God, I'm not going to say, well, I deserve to be getting to heaven, God. I've been a pastor for a long time and I've been serving you. I, I'm in trouble. If that's my confidence. Well, I went to Calvary Chapel Clunic, you know, for how many years? And I was there every Sunday, every Wednesday. God wants you here to learn. He wants you to serve him. But that shouldn't be your confidence. Your confidence should be in Christ. And what's going on in that heart, in that relationship. And if your heart is in that place, you can go out here and be confident no matter where you go. Now, verse 9, And Samuel took a suckling lamb, and he offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord Israel, and the Lord answered. And so what he, Samuel literally did with offering this suckling literally was to make sure that there was nothing between them and God at this point. So we can go to God cleanly. Now he goes on. Verse 10, now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered a loud thundering upon the Philistines that day. And so confused them that they were overcome by Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as, Beth, as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and he called its name Ebenezer saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. So we see something supernatural happening. They go out to battle. They're outnumbered. The weapons that are formed against them are greater 
than what they have. They have iron tools. They've already lost to this company of Philistines. And now they go out to battle and God intervenes. God literally sends thunder and it confuses the whole army. And Israel ends up destroying this army. You know, I, I thought in my own heart concerning this. Does God, because Israel was not confused in any way, but every, all the soldiers, the Philistines were. Does God at times confuse the enemy or the people that are enemies and not confuse us? Can God supernaturally do things like this? I believe that God does that still today. He separates his people from the lost to those who know God. Let me give an example. As a Christian today, you can hear what the Spirit of God is saying. When I was not a Christian, I remember reading stories in the Bible. I never read the whole Bible. But I read stories in the Bible. I was taught stories in the Bible, but I thought they were good stories. I never thought they were the Word of God. They never affected my life in any way. And the reason why is because I didn't have the Spirit of God living in me. Once I became born again, I began to read the Bible. I still didn't know all the, still all, all the answers, without a doubt, and I still don't today. God's still revealing to, those things to me. But I'll tell you, now that I'm born again, the Spirit lives in me, I can read the Bible, and there are so many things I understand that for my own personal life and for my own relationships that it's, it's an eye-opening. But if you try to tell these to people who don't know God, it's like they look at you like, are you crazy? Because the Word of God is only made alive by the Spirit of God and only God can speak those to His children. And during the Great Tribulation, we're going to see some astonishing things. We're not going to be there, but I'm saying we're going to see, we see a lot of astonishing things as we study it. And you would think, how can people be so hard when God even shows them that it's Him, His judgment? And they'll put their fist up and yell and scream and hate God because God does justice. And we think of that and I think, I, I've thought about, how can they do that? Well, they don't know God. They have no understanding concerning God, even the uh, judgment of God. They can't see, their eyes are blind, the devil hasn't blinded what they can't see, nor can they hear. So I can totally understand that now. Now he goes on, and a stone is set up between Mizpah and Shem. So God literally has, a, has Samuel put a stone up and whenever the stone, not all the time, but the majority of the time, a stone represented, and it has a name, as we'll see in just a moment, but it is to represent something that God did and to remind the people of the great things that God has done. The word here, Albanese, that's the name of the stone. It means the Lord has helped us. And I carry a stone in my pocket, and the reason why I carry a stone in my pocket is to remind me not to judge other people. He is without sin, let him cast the other stone. But as I was studying for this, my, new, my stone has a second meaning now. It reminds me of all the times that God has helped me. I said earlier that we have seen God answer so many prayers, and we have. But I want to ask you this question. I want you to think about it because I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to think about it. How has God helped you in the last month? How has God intervened? How has God blessed you or your family? And in order for you to see this, you're going to have to get your eyes off of whatever you're thinking and you're going to have to focus literally on what God has done. Because every single one of you in this room, if you're a Christian, have seen God do something, 
and provide for you, even if you haven't seen it, your eyes may be closed. And you have memorial, a memorial that God has done something supernatural. And God may have answered your prayer for somebody else to help someone else. So what has God done that you can have a memorial, a stone, so to say, for something God has done greatly? I look at a man who's on our board, Dennis. God has done a supernatural thing for him, without a doubt. And that's who he accredits to. The normal things that everyone is, that goes through, he didn't go through those things. God intervened. So Dennis has a memorial, and so do we, concerning, because we pray. Now, he goes on in verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel. From Ekron to Gath and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So I want you to notice something because I believe this is a, a spiritual truth. When Israel re repented, when Israel humbled themselves, when Israel confessed their sins, when Israel gave up their gods, Astrod, they had victory. But not only had victory, the Bible says here that Israel was restored. I want to read that word to you, the meaning of it, because I believe that God wants to restore and God does restore the years that the locusts have eaten are the years of sin. The word means to bring back to health, to strengthen, to bring back into being reestablished, renew, to bring back to former or normal conditions as by repairing, rebuilding, or altering. To restore a building, to per put a person back in place or position or into rank. So when we are in sin, when we are deliberately going against God, doing our own thing, literally we lose that place. That doesn't mean we lose Christ. It means we lose that place of where God's blessings are. When we repent, when we turn back to where God wants us to be, God restores these things, strengthens us, brings health back, and reestablishes us into that position or that rank that God wants us to be as a Christian. I believe that that's something very important that we need to understand. Because God wants those blessings. When we look at the prodigal son, remember the story of the prodigal son? The Bible says that when he came to his senses, after he went out and did his own thing, he came to his, sen his, his senses and he went to his father and he repented and he said, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me be one of your servants. And his father said, put on, my sa put on the sandals, put on the new robe, and he restored him back to his sonship. And literally, the blessings that as a son he was to receive. And I believe that as Christians, it's the same thing for us as Christians. We're restored as we repent. As we do what God says concerning the word. As we return to him. Okay? Now, verse 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. Then he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So Samuel finished his, well, went on a circuit on a regular basis to different cities and judged. The word judge literally means that he did justice. He would hear cases and deal with each problem as they went, and he would do it the way that God said according to the word of God. 
So he worked hard, the Bible says here. Let me share just a couple of things. And I, I, I do this specifically for a reason. It says here that he served God really all his whole life. From being young until he became old, he served God. He was finished serving God when he was time to go home, or God took him home. I wrote down four things that I want to share real quickly, and then we're done. First of all, serving God is an honor. Serving God is an honor. Whatever God has called you to do, it is an honor because God has called you to do it. I can't imagine if the most respectful person that I know, that I show honor to, would come to me and say, I want you to do this. I've chosen you to do this. Well, the most perfect person has called you in to the honor of serving him in some capacity. And so if we look at it in God's calling as an honor from God and the ability given by God, it it's, shouldn't be a problem at all. The second thing I wrote down is that we must do it as unto the Lord. If you do it as unto man, you're going to be let down pretty, pretty hard. The Bible says we are to do everything as unto the Lord. I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. Not only that, with it, doing as unto the Lord, you do it with quality. You do it with your best ability because it's unto the Lord. It's unto God. You don't take shortcuts. You don't, you know, half-heartedly do it. You put your heart into it because it is unto the Lord. The second one is out of love. We're to serve God and please God because we love God. Once we get out of the place of, well, I'm just doing it out of motions. I'm in trouble. And here's what happens. Well, my heart's not in it anymore. I don't feel like I should do this anymore. So I think I should just stop doing it. I'm going to step out of it. That doesn't solve anything. It doesn't remove the calling that God has on your life and what God has called you to, to fill in the place of where God has put you in that part of the body. What has to happen, there has to be a change of heart and there has to be a repentance, literally. When Jesus was speaking to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelations, they would have done all those works and everything else, but one thing was wrong with them. They have left their first love. They no longer were motivated by love. And God said, Jesus Christ said to this church, I have this against you. There's a serious problem with you serving me. You're doing all these things, but your heart's not in it no more. Get your butt over here. Repent. Repent. He didn't say, quit doing it. Okay, I'll get somebody else. He said, you need to repent. And the third one is by the power of the Spirit of God. John the Baptist, when his disciples came to him, they said, many are coming to Jesus. You know what? They're not coming to you no more, John. And John said to his disciples, he must increase and I must decrease. You see, the power of God's Spirit, God wants to increase in your life and in your heart and control you and enable you. But in order for that to happen, there must be a decreasing of self. There has to be. The biggest battle that's going to go on in your life concerning serving God and the power of the Spirit and the power of the flesh is you. But if you die to self, if you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Christ, literally the Spirit of God is going to be in, in, enable you to do it, no matter what it is, no matter how long it is. Could you imagine the Spirit of God wearing out? 
The Spirit of God never wears out. It's an ever ready battery, so to say. It keeps going and going and going. And then the last one, number four, it is hard work. He worked hard. Serving God is not just something that, you know, well, it's supposed to be just easy, you know. There's going to be times that it is really easy. There are times I get up and I teach and I've studied for hours. I get up and, man, it just flows. It's so easy. And you think, wow, that was easy. That was good. Okay, there's other times, man, I'm up here and, man, I'm struggling even though I've studied. The Bible says to be to teach the Word of God in season and out of season as a pastor. In other words, there's going to be times you don't feel like it. There's going to be times that you're going to have to make yourself do what you're supposed to do. As parents, don't we know that? Those who hold jobs, how many of you every day feel like, man, I just love going to my job every day. I've been doing it for 40 years. I just love it. I can't wait to get there tomorrow morning. But the point is, is this. Serving God is work. It's going to cost you. It costs his disciples. And it costs them their lives even. My point is, it's work to serve God. It's a commitment. It's a giving up of other things. Some of you would like to have stayed home tonight and just sit there and watch your television and be by the fireplace. And let me tell you, there's been times I wanted to sit at home and watch it, be on the fire, by the fireplace too. But you know what? I have to say, wait a minute. That's 10th or 20th or whatever it may be. That's not first. God's first. So Samuel, the man of God, it is made a statement of him is that he served the Lord and worked concerning the service of God. Okay, we're going to stop there. Any questions on tonight's study? No questions? Yes, okay, I'm sorry, Dan, I didn't see you over in the corner. <laughs> um, I know of, I think, I mean, in the Bible, I think there's three. How many do you know of? You probably know better than I do. Mm-hmm. In the fourth chapter? Right. Uh-huh. Right. Let me look at real quickly and see, Dan. I don't know if I know for sure, so I'm not going to... In chapter 4...